Okay, let's turn on our Bibles, if you have it, to Leviticus chapter 25. You know it's going to be deep when he starts out of Leviticus, right? And um, we'll get there in a moment. By the way, just uh, a little bit off track, but how many of you saw the memorial service for Pastor Chuck Smith on the Internet last week? Golly, let me just give you a little bit of a no extra charge, a blessing. If you, you can just go on to Google. You can download it. You can watch it. Uh, they have it on the, on the Calvary Chapel website. It was about almost four hours long. It was supposed to be three hours, but Brian Broderson, who is Chuck Smith's son-in-law, his job was to keep all these Calvary Chapel preachers to stay within their allotted time, which is not an easy task. In fact, he got up and gave a special kudos to John Corson because he was the only one that stayed on his time limit. But what do you do? You get up and you try to talk about a man that's had an impact in your life for 40 or 50 years. And some of these guys go way back with Chuck. My wife and I were in Kona, and we watched it live by live stream. And we were with a man in his late 80s who had helped Chuck start the Foursquare Church that he started even before Calvary Chapel. So it was a joy watching, uh, watching it with him and seeing all these Calvary guys. They did a really great job. They had some of the old groups like Love Song and uh, Mustard Seed Faith. And then they had some of the newer groups um, like Evan Wickham and Phil Wickham. And then they had a lot of the Calvary guys. And they had non-Calvary guys like Rick Warren and... Uh, um, uh, Alistair Begg and James McDonald and others just honoring Chuck Smith and it was just really a, a blessing to see and I was reminded in my early days this is this is um, a little funny story it's how I met Chuck Smith or how he met me I got saved in Santa Cruz California which was almost 400 miles north of where the revival was going on in Costa Mesa there was only one Calvary Chapel in the world now there's about 2,000 uh, but then there was one Calvary Chapel and um, one of, one of my guys, my bunk mate in the Jesus house that led me to the Lord and got me off the beach, his brother, his twin brother was in the band, The Parable. His name was Gary Arthur, and this guy's name is Larry Arthur. So Larry took me down. I got saved in April or May, and he took me down to a Calvary camp that was in July. So I was a brand new convert, and I had listened to a lot of Chuck Smith tapes, but I had never met him before. So it's kind of a camp for young people, and so you, know, you have Bible studies in the morning and prayer meetings, and then you have the afternoons to have fun. And so we decided to play up a pickup softball game. So we just, you know, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, and it went all the way around. And I ended up on Pastor Chuck's team. I was also in the same infield with him in this little pickup game. So I'm playing shortstop, and he's playing first base. So the other team gets up and hits a line drive over my head for a single. And the left fielder gets it and fires it into me, and I get the, I get the relay throw. So... In, um, in sports, it's okay to be deceptive. So I was trying to be deceptive <laughs> to not let the guy rounding first base know that I saw where he was. So I was kind of looking off this way so he would take more of a load off, more of a, a lead off first base so I could fire the ball to Chuck and get him out. Uh, and I apparently did a really good job of deceiving both of them because <laughs> Chuck didn't know I was going to throw it in. So I turned really quickly. I didn't have time to think about it. And I fired the fastest fastball I could. And Chuck was looking the other direction. <laughs> and he turned like that, and bang, the thing hit him right in the head, knocked him right on his keister. I'm not telling I'm not exaggerating. He fell down. I went, oh my gosh, I have just killed the Moses of the Jesus movie. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he gets up off the ground and pats himself off and says, and what's your name, young fellow? <laughs> and he never forgot me after that. So at least I can say Chuck never forgot me. But uh, not on such good terms. But... Um, I was talking to Bonnie the other day, and she asked me for the title of the message with the scripture, and I gave it to her, and I've changed my mind. So it's to uh, totally uh, uh, not going to be on that subject. But I've just been watching the news the last couple of days and looking at the, what's going on down at the Capitol, and, and uh, God bless so many people who have gone down there to testify. It's been a glorious thing. But uh, it, it brings to light not only what we're trying to do now, Praise the Lord for Elwin Ahu and for some of these others. Elwin, uh, being a former judge, was able to really give some articulate, clear testimony down there. But my purpose is not to get into that argument. But to just look at and ask the question, what is the church's role in the world? Like, what are, what are we supposed to be doing in the world? Jesus gave these, these um, all kind of ambiguous terms like salt of the earth and light of the world. What does that mean? What does it mean to be the salt of the earth? Well, we've got to be in the earth, and salt needs to be in the earth, so how, how, how far do you got to go in the earth to be the salt of the earth? How far does the Christian need to go in the world to be in the world but not of the world? Jesus said, I pray that you would not take them out of the world, but that you 
keep them from the evil one, but leave them in the world. And uh, Jesus and Paul and all the other Bible teachers or Bible writers said a lot about our impact on the world. It says in uh, Philippians chapter 2 that we are to shine as lights in the world. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. So you got all these verses, but how do we apply it? Now, if you read church history, you'll see that we have applied it in many different ways. How many of you know when Christians take up arms and they go killing their enemies in the name of Jesus? That's not so cool. Uh, that's not exactly what Jesus said. But on the other hand, are we supposed to just let the world go literally to hell? Or are we to hide in a little corner in our Bible studies and prayer meetings and just put a sign up outside the church and invite them to come to church? When Jesus said we got to go into the world and proclaim the good news. So I'm thinking a lot about that. And I'm just going to try to give as best as I can today a macro kind of a message. It's going to be a, in the beginning we're going to be bouncing around a lot. We're going to start in Leviticus, then we're going to go to Isaiah 61, then we're going to go to Luke chapter 4. Hopefully it'll all tie together by the time we get done. But the uh, title of the message is The King and His Kingdom. And I'm going to say that the king and his kingdom, obviously the king is Jesus, the dom, you got a king, you got a dom to have a king dom. The dom is the dominion of the king. What is the kingdom of God? Now again, in church history, we have swung from one extreme to the other. One particular famous Bible, uh, study Bible, actually said in its earlier editions that the kingdom is totally future and that um, you can't even obey the Sermon on the Mount. To think we can love our enemies and go the extra mile and turn the other cheek and all that, that's just, that's airy, hairy, fine, uh, pie in the sky. We can't do that. Uh, so that's not even relevant for today. So that's one extreme, which I think all of us would say is kind of silly because every scripture is given to us by God. But on the other hand, we got people who try to change society and they try to bring the kingdom. And we, there's a contemporary teaching called Kingdom Now Theology that is, uh, in my opinion, an error because we're not going to bring the kingdom until Jesus comes. But the kingdom is something that we're to seek. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his Righteousness. Now hang on to the word righteousness because it's going to come up several times in the message. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Unless you humble yourself and become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Um, <clears throat> Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, if the kingdom is totally heaven and totally future, how come we're supposed to pray for it to come to earth? Hmm. Maybe it has something to do with the will of God because he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Oh, so maybe the kingdom of God is the will of God. Maybe the kingdom of God is the rule and reign of King Jesus that will be totally consummated when he comes back again, when the king comes back. But what about in the meantime? Like what does Romans 14, 17 mean when it says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit? See? Now, a lot of us want peace and joy, but are we willing to pay the price of living righteously to get the peace and the joy? A lot of us want liberty and freedom, but are we willing to do it God's way to get God's liberty, which is real liberty? And as Jesus said, he that the Son sets free is free indeed. So it must be possible to be kind of free and then to be free indeed. And what the world wants is they want total shackles taken off of themselves. They don't want any commandments. They don't want any authority figures. They just want to be able to do what they want to do. And you and I were like that too before we came to Jesus. Now we realize he's the Lord. He's the king. He's the king of the dom. And I'm a part of the kingdom. It says in Colossians 1.13 that he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So all that to say this. What does the Bible say about our involvement in things like, like, like why should we try to get villages in Africa and India cl access to clean water? Uh, in YWAM, we've got a ministry called Mercy Ships and another one called YWAM Ships. And we've got these ships that are going around the world. Like in Micronesia, for instance, there are hundreds of, I hundreds of inhabited islands in Micronesia that have three visits a year from the outside world by means of a freighter ship or something. And yet those ships are, they have to park way outside of the reef and then they run goods back and forth, maybe some antibiotics or something. But other than that, if you get sick, within those three months, you're a goner. And so now we're taking medical ships into these places. Why should we do that? Why don't we just pass out tracks 
uh, and give them tickets to heaven and say, well, if they died, they go to heaven. It's because we serve a king who's a benevolent king, a loving king, a king who cast out demons, a king who healed the sick, a king who held little children on his knee, and a king who decided that uh, he could even feed 5,000 people and not demand that they get saved. How many of you know Jesus didn't come run the kind of ministry that I'll give you the goodies with strings attached? Jesus represented the perfect love of God, and he loves people right where they are. And so, anyway, let's jump into this text here. We want to look at something that's buried in the Levitical law uh, that is something that's very interesting when it comes to the ministry of Jesus himself. And we're going to start out in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 8. Count off seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven years, so that the seven Sabbaths of years amount to a period of 49 years. Now don't get nervous here. This is third grade math. Seven <laughs> times seven is 49. We're not too deep yet. Okay. Then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the 10th day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, we all know what that was. That was the day when the priest, the one day of the year when the sins of the of the camp were, the sins of the nation were atoned for. And this, of course, we know foreshadowed Jesus coming and being the atonement for our sins. But on the day of atonement, sound the trumpet throughout your land. Ba, 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 ba. What does it mean? Verse 10. Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land. Now, quote, proclaim liberty throughout the land. Does that sound familiar to anybody? If you've ever been to Philadelphia and you've gone to Independence Hall, and then right down the road's a good cheesesteak place, but go there for lunch. <laughs> but then you come up uh, and you go across to the Liberty Bell. You get to see the Liberty Bell. You're not supposed to touch it, but I, I kind of touch it. But, uh, but it has a big crack in the Liberty Bell. And then it says, inscribed in steel, the, the, the forgers of the steel that made the bell said, proclaim liberty throughout the land, Leviticus 25.10. Maybe they didn't hear about this separation of church and state thing. You know, because this was the state saying the church has something to say to us that God wants the United States of America to stand on principles of religious liberty and we were to proclaim that liberty throughout the land. In other words, the year of Jubilee that's given to the Jews in a specific context was also applied by our founding fathers to mean that the U of S is to stand for liberty. And the famous dictum has come up many times where I'll agree, I'll disagree with you and I'll fight you uh, verbally over this issue, but I will also fight for your right to say what you're going to say because that's part of religious liberty and liberty of the press, freedom of the press. These are all things that come from the Bible into our culture. Now, don't ask me. Well, if you do ask me, be ready for a couple of hours of lecture. But uh, don't ask me how intelligent people in our society can see the blessings of God on our founding fathers and on this republic because we uh, had these principles that we went by from the Bible and then let, let them go. Uh, but anyway, proclaim liberty throughout the land. To all its inhabitants, and it shall be a jubilee for you. Each one of you is to return to his own family property and to each to his own clan. The 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow, do not reap what grows of itself or harvested in un untended vines. For it is a jubilee and it is to be holy for you. Eat only which is taken directly from the fields. Okay, verse 13. In this year of jubilee... Everyone is to return to his own property, his own land, his own aina. If you sell land to one of your countrymen or buy it from him, do not take advantage of each other. Now, there's way too much here to read. Let me just pick out some nuggets. Do not take advantage of each other, verse 14. Verse 17, do not take advantage of each other, but fear the Lord your God. Verse 18, follow my decrees so you can live safely in the land. Verse 19, then the land will yield its fruit and you will eat your full and live there in safety. Uh, this is what the Jews called shalom. Shalom had to do with peace, righteousness, and human flourishing. He talked about practical things like uh, 
Um, every man will have his own vine and his fig tree. And, and it even talks about marriage and says a man and a wife and a, and, a, and a nuclear family can be like the days of heaven on earth. And there's these wonderful promises given to us from the scriptures, but we all know that the children of Israel didn't break any records in obeying these things. Some of them did, some of them didn't, and they undertook the judgment of God oftentimes because they didn't. So the rest of that chapter and the next two chapters talk about uh, if there's a poor person in the land, don't charge him interest and don't sell him food for profit. Sell him food at cost. Why? Because we don't want to have any poor among us. It says in several places in the scriptures that we are to have gleanings for the hungry and so forth. So what the 50th year was, what the year of Jubilee was, was God all of a sudden calls a time out. No more business, no more farming, no more nothing. Let everything lay fallow. Everybody go back to your original land. All property is given back to the original owners. Every, everything's going to be leveled off and even. It's almost, shall I dare say, a little bit of socialism there. But it was because God knew the nature of ourselves that some of us are just better than others at making money. And some of us are better at wheeling and dealing in business than others. And some of us at the end of 50 years or two generations are going to end up having more than the others. Now, there's nothing wrong. In fact, there's something very right about investing your time, talents, and treasures in building up your own personal fortune. But when God knew that we weren't going to take care of the poor, he instituted in the law a provision for the poor saying every 50 years, you might have even blown it financially and got yourself poor. That's okay. Everything's even. You may not be as smart as this guy, and so therefore you're poor. That's okay. You might live in a part of the land that experienced a drought, and you didn't. That's okay. Everything's even. And the word is the year of the Lord's favor is what it is called in Isaiah. So God basically said, time out, grace, grace, the favor of God on his people. The word grace means unmerited favor, and God was giving grace way back in the book of Leviticus. Now let's jump to Isaiah 61, and I want to read what is probably a familiar portion of scripture to you, but um, if you, back there, David Hawking has a, a great Outlines in Isaiah book that he gave me a few years ago. It's an excellent book, but the book of Isaiah, nobody disagrees with this. First 39 chapters are pretty much historically related to Israel as a nation. Chapters 40 to 66 are pretty much a prophecy about their time, but also about the future and, and the coming Messiah. So right in the middle of this, and if you look up at the top, at least in my Bible, there's a little heading that says, the year of the Lord's favor. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, the release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Then he gives this beautiful passage to comfort all who mourn, to provide those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. There'll be oaks of righteousness. There's that word again. The planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And then down in verse 8, for I the Lord love justice. Now, Theology 101 will tell you that you don't want to pit one attribute of God against another. You don't want to say God loves us, therefore he's not just. It's not justice is the other side of God's love. It's that God in his perfection <clears throat> loves justice. He told us in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, this is what the Lord requires of you. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. So the purpose of court systems, the purpose of governments, the purpose of businesses, the purpose of education is to help people to learn how to live righteously, which comes from the word right, or justly in the world. Um, in Psalm 145, 17, it says that God is just in all of his ways and kind in all of his doings. So we know that God is justice. Uh, there's a fellow who wrote a book a couple years ago, and I, I did a pretty nasty uh, review of the book. 
but it was called Love Wins. And in the book, what he was trying to say was love conquers everything and eventually everybody's going to get saved and everybody's going to go to heaven and there's really no judgment. But if God doesn't judge and if he's not just, then he's not loving. It's all a part of his perfections, which are all brought together in this wonderful, beautiful thing called the character of God. How would you wives feel if you're walking down the street and some demon-possessed maniac, you, yeah, how would you wives feel if you're walking down the street with your husband and a demon-possessed maniac comes up with a switchblade, pulls it out, puts it to your wife's throat, says, I'm going to cut you in a hundred pieces. How many of you wives would feel good if your husband said, love you, honey. God bless you. I'll see you in heaven. I'll keep a cabin in the corner of glory land for you. See you later. You would probably say, ba 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 honey, I thought you loved me. Now, what would be the most loving response to Mr. Demon Possessed Maniac? Well, I guess you try to talk him out of his foolishness and try to warn him that you're going to call the police and do something very copacetic and very cool and so forth. But, worst comes to worst, what do you do? You grab that bugger's arm and you make sure he doesn't slit your wife's throat and if necessary, you have to use force to do it. Now, I'm not going to start preaching on, the, on war here today, but I'm just saying that a wife would would be justified in thinking, if you don't help me and concern for my highest good, you don't really love me. If you get take care of the bugger and you save my life, you love me. Is this common sense here? We're not talking rocket science. So God is a God of justice. He loves justice. He says, for instance, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. Just punishment for, for the crime. The punishment meets the crime and so forth. So you have this throughout the Old Testament. And then you have... The prophecy about the Messiah coming here saying that the Spirit of the Lord is on me to bring good news to the poor. But then he talks about various forms of injustice. Some people are oppressed. Oppression is a bad thing. So I want to set you free from oppression. Some of you are brokenhearted. I want to set you free from that suffering. Some of you are poor. I want to set you free from that poverty. I want to bring the favor of the Lord, of the, the year of the Lord's favor to you. Okay, that's Isaiah. Now let's jump over to Luke chapter 4, and we'll find something very familiar. Now, context, Jesus was 30 years of age approximately. He had been serving in his hometown of Nazareth, mostly at a secular job at his father's uh, carpentry shop. And um, he shows up one day in the local synagogue, verse 16 of Luke 4. Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. Now think about this. Jesus is a little boy. There was probably people in that synagogue that were older. They've been watching him grow up since he was a little kid. Nazareth wasn't that. Nazareth was just a small town. It wasn't a big city. So you know pretty much everybody knows everybody. This is Jesus, the son of Joseph. He works in the carpentry shop. And uh, he goes to church all the time because it says he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, which was his custom. So he was a regular church-going boy, but nothing special as far as they could tell. Now, I don't know if they ever watched him play soccer and noticed that he never got mad at anybody or that he never up, got uptight, he never cussed, he never swore, he treated everybody with kindness, he never sinned. I mean, I don't know how that got by them, but I guess it did because they weren't uh, impressed. Uh, he was just one of the boys. But something's going to change at this little encounter here. As he stood up to read, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. Now, it, it doesn't sound like they were going verse by verse through the scroll, and it just happened to land on Isaiah 61. It looks like the attendant gave it to Jesus as a gesture of kindness. Hey, Jesus, could you read? And he, well, hang on just a second. He's going to, and he gets down to chapter 61, and he says... The Spirit of the Lord, verse 18, is on me because he has anointed me, here we go again, to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty for the prisoners, the recovering of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Dot, dot, dot. What is not there is what is in Isaiah, which says, and to proclaim the vengeance of our God. The day of vengeance of our God. Interesting, the year of the Lord's favor, one day of vengeance. But even the day of vengeance is not mentioned. Why? Because Jesus is trying to bring in as much grace 
and as much forgiveness and as much good news and as much liberty as he possibly can. There will be a day of vengeance, and we read about it in the book of Revelation. But for right now, Jesus is saying, I'm just here to proclaim the Lord's favor. I'm here to show you folks grace. I am the year of Jubilee in person. Now, this, this is kind of uh, interesting here. He rolled up the scroll, gave it to the attendant, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. Have you ever had that experience? You're in a crowded movie theater and your cell phone goes off or something, and you, you're trying to get a hold of it, and everybody's looking at you, and you're at the point of the movie where the plot is going to be solved, and everybody's, and the eyes, <laughs> the eyes of everyone is fastening on Jesus. So it's interesting. It says he read the scripture, then he sat down. It doesn't tell us how long he was sitting. I'm sure it was at least a few seconds. And there's all these people fastening their eyes on him. And he's just sitting there. Now, I don't know how long he remained quiet, but the next phrase says, and he began. So this is the first thing he said. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I know you've been watching me at the carpenter shop and you've seen me playing soccer and you saw me play when I was a little kid uh, and you've seen me grow up. But today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I am the servant of the Lord. That's the year of Jubilee in person. Verse 22. All spoke well of him and were amazed. Now hang on to this. At the gracious words that came from his lips. Oh, is this not Joseph the carpenter's son? This is little Jesus. And he's grown up. Gracious words proceeding out of his mouth. Jesus kind of smells something coming here. So he says in verse 23. Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you, now he gives two quick stories that it tells us in verse 28 made them furious. What were the two stories? I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time. And when the sky was shut for three and a half years and he, there was a severe famine throughout the land, Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Hey, wait a minute. Zidon, Sidon, that's not Israel. That's not what he did. But, but. And there were many in Israel with leprosy at the time of Elisha the prophet, and yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Jesus is talking in very positive terms here about a, Sidon, a, a Sidonian woman and a Syrian um, leader here and all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard us they got up drove him out of the town took him to the brow of the hill on which to throw him down the hill but he walked right through the crowd and went his way i love that part uh that's all another sermon there though but jesus got away from them and then he went on into his ministry he does a couple of miracles to the end of the chapter and then in verse 43 he says i must preach the good news of the kingdom of god so it's not totally future and it's not totally present. It's the already and the not yet. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Okay, that's a lot of, a lot of scripture for a little preacher. But uh, let me just try to bring it all together as we begin to close. And that is, I want to encourage us to be praying for Obviously, your missionaries that are out there on the field doing some of this stuff. But even getting back here to um, the windward side of Oahu, what is the church supposed to do here? Oh, there's a lot of people who are of the opinion that we should just stay in our Bible studies, stay in our little corner, keep quiet, take care of our own, don't worry about what's going on in the world. Take, if you get any Christian girls that, that uh, get pregnant, you know, let's take care of them, make sure they don't have abortions. But don't worry about Joe Blow down the street having an abortion. That's his business. That's the state. That's the separation of church and state. You're supposed and But we go back to our founding fathers, and we see so much of our republic was founded directly upon Scripture. For instance, did you ever wonder why didn't George Washington become the king of the United States? Why don't we have a king? Because George Washington read his Bible and he knew that the Bible said that man is fallen. We were singing about that in one of the songs today. Uh, that, that there's a fall. It has affected us. And he knew that even though he was as sharp as he could be as a, as a political leader and as a Christian, as, as far as we know he was a Christian, 
We see him praying at Valley Forge and so forth. But the, he didn't want to become a king because he saw what King George did to them. King George had them under uh, repressive rule. They were being oppressed in England. So they went on an errand in the wilderness. They came here to the United States. And then they said, proclaim liberty throughout the land. Let's put it on the bell. That's what we all stand for. But he knew, even as a good person, he couldn't trust himself. I can't run this place. If I run this place, I become a dictator, and I'll be in my own way, just like King George. So he points out a verse, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, which says, The Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our king. Three different aspects of God's rule that with, from which we get our executive, legislative, and judicial branches of the government. The way our government is supposed to function is justly. But you can't guarantee you can't you can't guarantee it in any sense. But it's really harder to guarantee it if one guy's calling the shots. If you get a bad guy calling the shots, you end up with a tyrant. You end up with a Stalin. You end up with a uh, or a Hitler or a Mussolini. And by the way, democracy is not the only way out of this fix because Mussolini and Hitler were elected in elections that were quote fair. Now, I don't know how fair they were. Just like this latest election in Egypt. I was just talking to some of my Egyptian friends the other day. Were you aware that within the last two months there's been 75 churches burned to the ground in Egypt? Mostly Coptic Orthodox churches, some evangelical churches. And they did it because the Muslim Brotherhood was elected into office and the people, the, the general populace gave them a year to try to pull off a, a decent, just government. They were unjust, they were full of corruption, so the people said no more. Millions of them took to the streets and booted the bug us out. And there are people, I saw people on Facebook saying this was a duly elected uh, group and that we should have left them in. But did you know what they were doing? They were burning churches down, they weren't standing for liberty. So just because the majority rules doesn't mean it's right because the majority can be wrong. Uh, I was talking to some German friends of mine recently, they were saying, German people are not any worse than anybody else, and they weren't any worse than anybody else back in the day. But Hitler and Joseph Goebbels convinced them, you know, things are going to be a little nasty for a while, it's going to be a mess, but if we get rid of these Jews, if we get rid of homosexuals, if we get rid of the Catholics, then there's a bright day, because we know, and Dr. Mengele and some of our other doctors are helping us see that we white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Aryan people are the superior race. And Wagner says so through his music, and Nietzsche says something through his uh, philosophy. And so once we get rid of all these, and the Jews will be the final solution. Let's get rid of them. Then we're going to take over the world, and then everything's going to be peaceful. So Hitler was coming together with his people to try to form a satanic shalom, all because he had gotten away from God. And boy, I could really get off on that. But the point of the matter has to be on the fact that how much do we have to say about something like this. I want to recommend a couple of books to you. Both of them are big, thick ones, so they're not easy Sunday afternoon reading, but you will be blessed, guaranteed, if you read. Blessed or your money back. <laughs> One's called Bonhoeffer, prophet, spy, pastor, missionary. It's by a guy named Eric Metaxas, and it talks about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a Lutheran pastor in Nazi Germany. He went on the radio to preach the gospel. He spoke a lot of these... Um, uh, kind of fireside chat types things. He started speaking against Hitler's regime and against Nazism. Of course, they booted him off the air. He proceeded to smuggle Jews out of Germany into other places in the free world. He got caught, and he was thrown into prison. But before he was thrown into prison, he was as a spy running information back and forth um, uh, to the Allies and to try to... He was actually in, involved in the plot to kill Hitler. Now, if you uh, saw the movie Valkyrie with Tom Cruise, did anybody see that film? Very close to the truth, a very accurate movie. Bonhoeffer was actually supplying a lot of the information toward the July 20th plot. Now, we know that it failed, and von Schlausenberg and many others got executed as a result of that. But while Bonhoeffer was in prison, he's sitting there asking himself the question, how can I, as a Christian, as a minister of the gospel, actually plot to assassinate my leader. The Bible says thou shalt not kill. The Bible says thou shalt not murder. I'm a peace-loving, born-again Christian. And he worked it through, and he wrote a book called Ethics. Ethics is the issue of right and wrong. Now, there are four crucial questions everybody in the world asks themselves, whether they're Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, tribals, atheists, Christians, Jews, whatever. 
Four questions. Number one, where did I come from? Number two, why am I here? Number three, what is, what is the basis for right and wrong? How can I know how to live? And number four, where am I going? Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. And Bonhoeffer came up with the answer to all those questions, and he came to the conclusion that not only, and he, and he looked at a verse in the book of James which says, to him that knows to do good and does not do it, it's a folly and a shame unto him. If you know to do good and you don't do it, it's a sin. This is what the Catholics call a sin of omission as compared with a sin of commission. A commission is, I lied to that person. Omission is, I just didn't tell the truth. Okay, so both of them are sin. And Bonhoeffer says, with the knowledge that I have and with the context that I have, and having a direct connection to von Schlausenberg, who can actually get rid of the guy, I will be saving millions of lives, and I will be saving the world from the tyranny of a probably demon-possessed, crazy man. And I don't think anybody here would argue with me on that. But uh, that's what Bonhoeffer came up with. But the issue came back to the issue of, yes, there's individual relationship with the Lord and the kingdom of God, which came to send Jesus to the cross, but there's also... What do we have to contribute to the good of the world as Christians? Do you know anybody that's not a Christian who wouldn't say that if you keep the Ten Commandments, they'd be happier? Even a mafia don who commits adultery with everybody else's wife will get mad if you commit adultery with his wife. Why? Because he has a conscience, because he's made in the image of God. Even the, the famous uh, atheist, Richard Dawkins, who wrote the book The God Delusion, starts accusing the God of the Bible of all kinds of injustices when he gets the very definition of injustice from the Bible. <laughs> because he's born in Britain and Britain still has a general understanding of what's right and what's wrong. Adultery is wrong. Lying is wrong. Cheating is wrong. <clears throat> now we're coming up to the issue we're dealing with in the legislature. Who can say whether it's right or wrong? Well, the, the majority is now saying this is right. Used to be wrong, but now it's right. My question is, just because the times they are a changing, is the truth a changing? And what we have in the Bible is the eternal word of God that has been used to, to just further the good of so many <laughs> nations. Let me just give you a couple stories. 1792, a 23-year-old cobbler, uh, shoemaker, went to his Baptist church and said, I feel like God's telling me to go to India to, to preach the gospel and to make disciples. And one of his leaders said, sit down, young man. God can take care of the heathen without your help. He doesn't need you. And he says, well, you guys are sending in the British East India Tea Company, and you're sending all kinds of goods out there, and we're buying their silk, and we're doing it for the sake of commerce. Why can't we do it for the sake of their souls? They're worshiping millions of false gods. Idolatry is clearly condemned in the Bible. Jesus told us to go into all the world. What are you waiting for? And so they said, ah, sit down. So he said, well, he sat down in his body, but he stood up in his spirit and said, no way. And he came under the authority of King Jesus as opposed to the authority of his church. And he went to India and he changed the nation. He translated the Bible into six languages, Assamese, Bengali, Hindi, and three other languages. He planted churches. He ran a Bible school. But he didn't just do the religious stuff. He got involved in the marketplace. He started implementing biblical principles of interest so that they weren't too high so that people wouldn't get into poverty. He taught the year of Jubilee to the Indian people. He established the first savings bank in all of India with just measures and just weights and so forth, just like the book of Proverbs says. The Indian people were very much, along with their Hinduism, were very much into astrology and living their lives by the stars. So he taught a class in the first liberal arts college in India that he started on astronomy. And he taught it from a biblical worldview, saying the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth shows forth his handiwork. Day unto day they utter their speech. Night unto night they bring forth knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of the one true God. Thousands of people were saved under his ministry and India was changed as a result. But as he's out there, you know, spending the first couple hours every day translating the Bible, he notices that there's this ceremony going on down by the Ganges River. And he's aghast to find out that if a young Hindu man dies, that his wife is required by law to throw herself alive onto the burning funeral pyre that has been doused in gasoline and to scream out in pain until she expires and her ashes get mixed together with her husband's ashes. They mix the ashes together and throw them in the Ganges River. 
because that will assure them with a better reincarnation in the next life. And William Carey goes to the British and says, we got to change this law. This is insane. This is human rights abuse to the max. How can we stand by and watch people be killed like this? You talk about pro-life. This is insane. And they said, don't mess with the culture. To them, it's not murder. To them, it's a part of their religion and it's a part of their culture. And who are you to impose Judeo-Christian British values on the Indians? He said, this is human rights abuses. This is violation. And they finally told him, look, William, if you're going to keep this up, we're going to kick you out of India and send you back to India. We're going to take away your visa. You know what he did? The rascal. He gave up his British citizenship, got himself a Dutch citizenship, labored in the Indian parliament, and outlawed sati. And there are thousands of Indian widows today that are glad that he did. And it's, it's illegal to do it today. Because they began to wake up and begin to see a little bit into the wisdom of the Bible that says that woman and that man are created in the image of God. He did everything he could. He translated the Bible. He, he, he actually taught a class on botany because he talked about the beauty of flowers and fauna and the beauty of the animals. And, and he taught the, taught the Bible from Genesis to Revelation so that they got a biblical understanding <coughs> and really changed the whole nation. Now, <coughs> India is still mostly Hindu today, but we're talking about millions of people came to Christ because William Carey was willing to take the Bible and to take some flack as he did it. We can talk about so many other countries, but I'm running out of time. Let me go through a couple of points really um, quickly, and then we'll say good night. We won't say good night. I won't have it here all night. We'll say good afternoon. This is Jesus' self-described job description. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to, number one, reach the poor with the good news. Now, we know this can be understood in two ways. There's the physically poor, and he came to bring good news to physically poor people. Keep in mind, Jesus had not yet died on the cross when he uttered these words. So this is not ultimately talking about the good news of the cross and resurrection yet. But of course, that can be applied because the cross and resurrection is the, the fulfillment of good news to the poor. Jesus also said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are you that are poor in spirit. But in either way, he gives good news to the poor. So if we're going to follow Jesus... And we're not just saying on our wristwatch or, or our, our little bracelet, what did Jesus do? We say, what did Jesus say he came to do? And he said he came to bring good news to the poor. Therefore, we should bring good news to the poor. <clears throat> now, India, another good example. Most of the hospitals, most of the orphanages, most of the clean water programs, most of the programs that are trying to rescue girls out of human trafficking are started, implemented, and continued by Christians. Now, there are lots of hospitals in India now that are totally run uh, by people from other religions and even atheists, but it was all started because Christians saw that what the man does when he sees his neighbor beaten up on the side of the road is to go take care of him and to be a good Samaritan. The Hindu worldview says if they're not of an upper caste, you don't take care of them because you want them to die so they can go into a better reincarnation in the next life. That's why human compassion is at such a low point in India. Now they're trying to change it, but they're buying our biblical worldview to do it. And so what we're simply saying is we're not only taking the gospel into all the world, we're taking the Bible into all the world. I just ordered yesterday 125 books by my friend Vishal Mangalwadi. He's an Indian man, and he can get away with saying this. But he wrote this book, and he calls it The Book That Made Your World, subtitled How the Bible Shaped the Soul of Western Civilization. He talks about heroism, for instance. Why does, un unless you've got mental problems, why does every single person in America bow their head when they hear about the New York City uh, Fire Department during 9-11? When we hear about police officers running back up in that burning building to try to rescue people knowing that we're probably going to die, why do we call them heroes today? Vishal says, well, let's go back to the time of Christ. What was a hero accepted by everybody in the time of Christ? <laughs> it was a gladiator who got in front of 50,000 people and slaughtered some other human being to death and left his blood and his limbs all over the ground and everybody cheering. That was a hero. What changed that? Well, Jesus sacrificed on the cross. Jesus' teaching on greater love is no man than this, and he laid down his life for his friends. And so all of us in the Western world say, a hero is somebody who lays down his life for others. In 
we could go on and talk about how so many of our values that we have in our secular culture are here because of the Bible, because the Bible gave us uh, those, those values. Number two, Jesus came to relieve us of our burdens. It says he came to, uh, to heal the brokenhearted. So many brokenhearted people in the world, so many people messed up. We need people to go out and just, just look for brokenhearted people and heal them. We got some of our young kids in YWAM, and they're, they're, they're so tongue-tied when it comes to sharing the gospel. Well, you know, and they don't know. How do you talk to postmodern young people about the Enlightenment and how secular humanism went? They don't know any of that. Just go out and love people. Go out there onto the streets and lay your hands on the sick and go up to some auntie and say anything I can pray for you about auntie and then just get to know her a little bit and tell her about the love of Jesus. Just get out there and heal the brokenhearted and you'll find the gospel will come up automatically. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. Number three, he came to release captives, prisoners, those that are oppressed. There's so many people today living under oppressive political regimes. Uh, just the other day I was seeing a video on I hate to keep picking on India, uh, but this was an Indian enforced, governmental enforced slavery in which you have women and children working for 12 hours a day, busting rocks with hammers out in the hot sun, getting paid 24 US dollars a month, barely enough to keep anything on the table. But it's a, and you can't do anything about it because the powers are in place. And so again, this is where the dom of the kingdom comes in. Now, I'm not talking about some kind of political overthrow. I'm not saying it's righteous to do crusades or to kill people in the name of Jesus. But what I am saying is we are in this in a battle. There is the kingdom of darkness and there is the kingdom of light. And God has chosen us not just to be sons and daughters in his family, but he's chosen us to be soldiers in his army. And he's chosen us to pick up our swords and pick up our weapons and take up our armor and do what we can to defeat the kingdom of darkness that's in this world. Not by military might, but by doing what Jesus did, which was to lay down his life for others. The best spiritual warfare we can do is to humble ourselves and lay down our life for somebody else. It might be something as laying down Thursday nights to go down to River of Life Mission. It might be something simple like that, or it might be something more macro as God gives it to you. We have the pictures of the Exodus in the Bible from Egypt. We have the pictures of the slave market in the Bible. We have pictures of demons being cast out of people to bring them deliverance. Jesus is really into freedom. If you study the early history of the Salvation Army, the early history of the Methodist Church, there was not only the gospel being preached, but as the Salvation Army liked to say, soup, soap, and salvation. We bring it all. Jesus is here to bring you good news. <laughs> Number four, he restores sight to the blind. One of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's a funny story. Jesus heals this blind man, and... Um, the religious leaders find out about it. They go to his parents and they say, hey, we just heard your, your son was healed. What's going on here? He said, well, I don't know. Why don't you go ask him yourself? He's of age. So they go over to the blind man and they say, don't you know that the man that healed you is a sinner? Jesus said, I don't know if he's a sinner or not, but I know one thing. I used to be blind. Now I can see. <laughs> Pretty simple. And then uh, Jesus calls himself the light of the world because he brings light into blind eyes. So he came to restore sight to the blind. And the last thing, and this is from Isaiah 61 as well, words like, he rebuilds the ancient ruins. He restores the devastated places. He renews the ruined cities. He revives the dead heart. Jesus is totally into bringing good news. So as we go today, as we go back out into our world where we work, live, and play, Let's just get a little bit of a bigger picture that it's not just, yeah, somebody gave me a track on a beach a couple years ago and I got saved and I'm going to go to God's kingdom when I die. But I've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And this book is the book, along with the power of God, that can heal the nations of the world and can heal the broken hearts of the world as well. I was laying ruins behind me. Swept away by the winds of your love Still the sadness remains When I consider the price you paid for my heart And I can hear the cracks of the wind And the roar of the crowd Voices of violence and misunderstanding Still you suffer
Surrender. 